Hello everyone, in this video we're going to take a deep dive into the David Bryant scam and analyse some of the many clues that there were to show that he was a scammer. I can't put them all in, there were hundreds, but I'll just put in the ones that come to me as I go through the previous videos. The first clue came before he'd typed a single word to Cassandra. He contacted her on Facebook and in the address bar at the top of the browser, and I use a laptop, you could see the name of the account holder, Prakali Agadagba, although the account was calling itself David Bryant. This little trick doesn't always work because sometimes the account name is just a string of numbers. And of course, Facebook isn't the only place that scammers can contact you. They'll contact you on all kinds of social media apps. The second clue that you're talking to a scammer is the complicated birth and where they've lived story. In this case, our man claims to have been born in the USA, have left there at the age of seven to go to Italy, and then at the age of ten, he began travelling with his father, his father presumably being either Italian or American. He then claims to have returned to the USA at the age of 28. Why did the scammers say this? Well, I suspect mainly it's to explain the fact that when you talk to them, they don't have an accent from the country where they claim to live. You'd probably expect this man to have either an Italian accent or one of the American accents. And I fully understand that not everyone will necessarily know what an American accent sounds like, or what an Italian accent sounds like, or what any other accent sounds like. So, don't take the word of the person that you're talking to for their accent. Hop onto YouTube and type in the country and accent and listen to a few people from that country. I actually found on YouTube a thing called the Worldwide Accent Project. Lots of people from around the world with different accents are reading the same piece of text. Once you've listened to a few French accents or Belgian accents or Croatian accents or wherever the person that you're talking to claims to come from, then compare it with their accent if they call you. Remember, our man claims to be from America and to have been to Italy. And here's a clip of his accent. Does it sound Italian or one of the American accents to you? Oh, okay. No, I'm just wondering if that's going to be okay. Like, you know, to pull you through the day's job, the remaining part of the day, right? Within 24 hours of meeting Cassandra, a man asked two classic giveaway scammer questions, one after the other. The first was, live alone? If you've just met somebody online... I don't think you'd ask them that. If you've met them on a dating app, you might ask them if they were currently in a relationship. And of course, the reason the scammers ask this is because they're trying to find out whether there's anyone else in your house that can warn you that you might be talking to a scammer. The second question, was you own the house or it's a rented apartment? Another classic scammer question and something that you simply would never ask someone that you've just met online. And of course, the reason why the scammers ask you this is because they're trying to gauge how much money they might be able to take from you. On the fourth day of the scam, a man told Cassandra that he was travelling home from Oakland to Florida and randomly decided to send her a copy of his itinerary. Why would someone do that? As part of the chat, you might very well tell someone that you're travelling. You might tell them what plane you're getting and what time the flight is. But would you send a copy of your entire itinerary to somebody that you'd only just met online? Somebody that wasn't going to come and meet you at the airport because they live in a different country. This is a classic scammer technique, sending you copies of their itinerary or their contracts. Things you simply wouldn't send someone, but they're doing it to validate their story and try and convince you that they're real. Chatting with you at times that simply don't make sense for the time zone where they claim to be, and then making excuses for why they're online at unusual hours is another classic scammer technique. In this case, a man claims to be in Oakland, Ohio. Oakland is eight hours behind the UK at the moment. It was half past ten, almost in the morning, when he made this post. Half past two, the middle of the night, in Oakland. You might be a bit surprised. I'm up early. I had to set an alarm so I can have a morning chat with you before you kickstart your day. If this happens to you, just ask yourself which time zone the person that you're talking to is more likely to be in. Repeatedly telling Cassandra 
not to work too hard. Hard work seems to be a concept that most scammers are afraid of. They don't want to do it, and they don't want you to do it either. It often goes with the scammer telling you that they hope that your work isn't too stressful, or that you didn't get stressed at work. This scammer didn't say that. And, of course, it goes with that other scammer obsession, sleep. Most scammers seem to spend their life permanently tired. They're either asleep, or they need to go to sleep. Clearly, scamming is a tiring occupation. All those clues, and many more, were in episode one, including, of course, the everlasting scammer obsession with food and repeatedly asking Cassandra what she's had for lunch. He does that throughout the scam. And I understand that this is partly a cultural thing. In some countries, have you eaten? It's just a form of greeting, in the same way that we Brits would say, how are you? Or, it's been raining today, because of course, everyone knows that we Brits are obsessed with the weather. But I suspect the main reason for doing it is that it saves them having to think of anything more interesting to ask you. It goes along with how was your night and how was your day, being asked repeatedly, a fairly good clue that you're talking to a scammer. On to episode two, and the scammer starts with the old emotional blackmail. I always want to hear your lovely voice. I missed hearing your lovely voice. A classic scammer technique, often used when they've just called you and they will say in the call, oh my, you have a lovely voice. If the person that you're talking to tells you in a call that you have a lovely voice, or they repeatedly tell you that they want to hear your lovely voice, then you're almost certainly talking to a scammer. It goes along with the demands for lovely pictures or beautiful photos. It's emotional blackmail. The person that you're talking to suddenly goes all coy and starts telling you they've never done this before, but they have these deep feelings for you. That's a sure giveaway that you're talking to a scammer. Usually coupled with fake nervous laughter. Listen as our man gives a classic demonstration. And remember, we're talking about an experienced scammer here, not the usual collection of idiots that appear on this channel that can barely string a sentence together, don't read what you're saying, and have no idea what they're talking about. This chap has done his homework, and he's done this many times before. Let me let me just speak that. I don't know, I said, I don't know if this is the right time, but um, it's just something I want to say, right? Well, go on, spit it out, man. Yeah. Mm hmm <laughs> as, my, as my father would have said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel really good, really happy with all smiles whenever I speak with you, right? Yeah, well, it's very kind and of I you. Feel, yeah, I feel these, um, um, like, they always say butterflies in my stomach, right? <laughs> So, yeah, I feel really good, and I don't know, I haven't felt like this in a long time. Oh right? my goodness. Randomly sending you lots of selfies. This is quite common for scammers to do. Often, they'll send you a load of selfies, and not even tell you why they've taken them, or where they've taken them. Obviously, they don't know either, because they're stolen photographs. In this case, as we found out in the videos, stolen from a real estate agent who works in Dubai. And I'm sure you remember the AIM Dubai, that terrifying ride that a little bit of online research told me is currently closed. So if the person that you're talking to says your photos, do some research. Let's take one of those photos that he sent and I'll show you how I do a reverse image search. The first step depends on which device and which browser you're using. You're going to need to do one of two things. Tap and hold, or in this case, right click on the image. I have the option to copy the image, save it, or search Google for the image. The reason for saving it is that most reverse image searches will ask you to upload the image. I use three. Well, mainly I use two. I use Yandex and I use Google. I actually find Yandex gives me better results quite often than Google does. I've never really had very much success using TinEye, but that's probably because I've usually tried Yandex before I get onto TinEye. One of the browsers that I have on my laptop is the Opera browser. Of all the browsers that I do have, and believe it or not, I have seven, Opera is the only one that will allow me to copy the image and upload it from the clipboard. You very well might have to save it to upload it. 
but for the purposes of this video, I will use Opera. So I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to go to yandex.com slash images. And you'll see there's this little icon here, which is the upload image button. So I'm going to tap on that. And you'll see that because I'm using Opera, I have the option to select the file, which is what you would do if you'd saved it onto your device, or paste it from the clipboard. So I'm going to paste that image that we just copied to the clipboard. In this case, I never actually found the original photo, but I was looking for that wheel. So I clicked on a few results until I was certain that I'd found the right wheel, which turned out to be the AIM Dubai. I then, of course, googled it and found its own website, which was where I discovered that the wheel itself was currently closed. And remember, our man had told us that he'd heard people screaming because it was such a terrifying ride. Let's try doing a similar thing with another of the images that he sent. I haven't actually even tried this one, so we'll do it together. Here's the man whose photos were stolen, standing in front of a building. I'm going to right click on the image, copy it, go back to images.yandex.com. I'm going to tap on the upload button. I'm going to paste from my clipboard. And although that specific image hasn't been found, there are a lot of images with a very similar looking building. Let's look at this one. It even seems to have the same bollards in front of the building. And this one, it tells me, is the Coca-Cola Arena in Dubai. Reverse image searching isn't an exact science, and you might not find the image that was sent to you. But you might find information about what's in the background. Sometimes this backs up the scammer's story. In this case, it checks out, because he's told us he's in Dubai. But in other cases, it doesn't. I have a scammer on the go at the moment, who sent me a photo of a building he claims to be constructing in Norway. The photograph was taken in a seaside resort in the United States. Poor use of English is often a giveaway, especially if the person that you're talking to claims to come from the United States or Australia or the UK. Of course, if English isn't your first language, it's harder to spot the mistakes in their use of language. This was an experienced scammer with good English, but even so, every now and then, he typed the old sentence that simply didn't make any sense, such as this one. Are you they gonna return the juice to you or sell them off? That was after Cassandra had told him that she was picking some apples that she was going to take to have them pressed for juice. Telling Cassandra that he couldn't call her on chat. That's not true. You can call someone on chat, although by default he tries to start a video call. If the person that you're talking to doesn't want to video call you, and comes up with all sorts of excuses for why they can't, but is willing to audio call you, just ask yourself why they don't want to video call you. And if they do video call you, look very carefully for those stolen videos. In this case, our man of course knew that he couldn't appear on camera, and so continued to call Cassandra by audio call only on Facebook. Cassandra didn't ask him to video call because she felt this was an experienced scammer, and she didn't want to spoil the scam. Now, let's take a look at that tax computation that he sent Cassandra. Our man claimed that he'd budgeted for 13 or 15 per cent to pay export duties. Well, actually, he said exports duties. Another subtle clue that he isn't the American citizen he claims to be, because it should be export duties. And he claimed that the export duties had risen due to Covid. OK, let's see how much export duty is if you're in Dubai. It's hard to find information on export duties from Dubai for the simple reason that there aren't any. This is what the UK government website tells us about exporting from Dubai or anywhere else in the UAE. There are no duties or tariffs on exports, it says. And this software company with offices in the UAE, Saudi and Bahrain tells me that although exports are considered as taxable supplies, they are zero rated, i.e. tax at zero percent is applicable on exports. So that completely destroys our man's story about paying export duty. I think in episode five, or maybe in episode four, I said I'd try and explain to you why I said 
that he was only aiming to make 10% profit. Actually, it should have been 9%. He'd budgeted for, and therefore charged his clients, for up to 15%, but that extra 9%, apparently, was more money than he had. Is it likely that our man would have done all that months and months of work, talking to his clients, finding out their requirements? Remember, he was in Oakland when we first met him. He'd had to pay to get there. He'd spent hours talking to his client. He'd paid for accommodation. He'd played for his flights back to Florida. And doubtless, there were many other clients. Is it likely that he would have done all of that and only have been aiming to make 9% profit? He told us that his clients had already paid him and he didn't come up with none of those ridiculous usual stories about not having access to his bank account. He simply said that he didn't have any money. Now, let's take a look at his story around that tax agent tax computation letter. In that letter, he was allegedly told that the boxes containing his gold and diamond jewelries would be withheld at their processing office until he'd paid the taxes. Well, were there any taxes due? That would make sense, obviously. It would be unlikely that they would let them go until the taxes had been paid. But we've already established that he doesn't have to pay any taxes. Then goes on to tell him that he's instructed to pay with immediate effect at the revenue office close to him as electronic or card payment are not acceptable because of the new FTA policy imposed. To me, that implies that he should pay in cash. Now, where is he going to get $288,000 in cash? I think it's unlikely that any tax office would expect someone to come in with that kind of money in cash and accept it from them. I think they'd find themselves accused of money laundering. He tried to explain to Cassandra that when he said cash, he meant an instant payment where they're, quote, gonna get the money fast because of past experiences. Cassandra, of course, pointed out that bank transfers are instant. And anyway, if he wasn't able to make the payment instantly, they would simply have retained the packages until the money had been safely transferred. And when finally Cassandra did agree to pay for him, well, I think she agreed to pay $12,500 because magically he'd managed to find the rest, he sent her the details of a money mule using a bank, whose name he couldn't spell correctly, Miss Ashley Lloyd's, with an address in Birmingham in the UK, and it was a personal account. Of course, that's the kind of detail that a genuine victim might overlook, because by then they would have been drawn into the scam. But of course, if you were really playing the FTA in Dubai, then it would be a business account in Dubai. It wouldn't be someone's personal account in Birmingham in the UK. I won't go into any more details, but I hope that you can see that if you're keeping your wits about you, even an experienced scammer will be giving themselves away at every turn. The reason that people don't spot that they're being scammed is not because the clues are not there, but because they've been drawn into the scam. And this has blindfolded them to what's actually going on. They've been flattered by the scammer and they've become addicted to the rush of hormones that interacting with the scammer gives them, just as surely as if they're addicted to drugs or alcohol. When real victims send money to scammers, they get a high, of course, from sending the money I don't mean that unkindly. They think they're doing a good turn. They believe they're helping someone. And of course, that makes you feel good, because that's a human trait. The scammer, of course, then compounds that by flattering their victim, telling them how much they love them, how wonderful they are. And that, of course, sets up a cycle from which the victim finds it very hard to escape. I hope you found this video useful, and I hope it's given you some clues as to the kind of research that you can do when you're talking to someone online. You'll often see or hear victims saying that they asked the scammer about their story, but the scammer had an explanation. Of course they've got an explanation. It's up to you to research that explanation and see for yourself whether it's believable. Wherever you meet someone online, keep your wits about you. You're especially vulnerable if you're on a dating site because, of course, you're looking to make a connection with someone. You're expecting them to tell you that they're widowed or divorced or single. So be careful. If it isn't someone local and you can't meet up with them, just ask yourself at every turn, is their story believable? 
and do your research. And even if you can meet them in person, keep your wits about you. I hope you found this video useful and I hope it's given you some clues about what to look out for when you're talking to someone online. And if you know someone, especially someone who maybe is a bit older and more trusting and possibly vulnerable because they've recently lost a partner, maybe share this with them so that they're pre-warned. When they then go on a dating site, they'll know what to look out for. So, as ever, please like this video, please share it, please comment down below, please subscribe to my channel and I'll actually see you again in David Bryant, episode 7, when he's talking to another of my characters.